So hi, everyone. Uh, today, we will be hearing from uh, Catherine Skinner. Uh, Catherine is an assistant professor in the Department of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering and the Robotics Institute at the University of Michigan. Uh, she's also the director of the University of Michigan Field Robotics Group. Uh, her research spans robotics, computer vision, and machine learning, focusing on enabling autonomy in dynamic and unstructured environments uh, across field robotics applications, such as underwater exploration and autonomous driving. Uh, her fieldwork has taken her to many exciting locations, uh, ranging from Sydney to Hawaii to Jamaica. Uh, she completed her postdoc at Georgia Tech and her PhD from the University of Michigan Robotics Institute, where her research received the outstanding honorable mention. Today, she will be talking about her research on deep learning for marine robot perception. And with that, I yield the floor to you, Catherine. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to talk to you all today about um, deep learning for marine robot perception. And uh, throughout this talk, I want to take a chance to highlight some challenges for marine robotics and uh, opportunities that we have to push the field forward. Uh, so I'd like to kind of start by taking a step back to give you kind of see where the robots fit in the context of C4 mapping uh, by looking at a very brief history, keyword brief, uh, history of C4 mapping. So marine environments make up 70% uh, of our planet. And for centuries, humans have sought to explore, map, and understand these environments. Um, and we've come up with uh, more and more advanced ways to do this over, over the centuries. So if we look back to the early 1800s, uh, some of the first methods to uh, map the C4, map the symmetry, are uh, these lead lines, so literally lead tied to the end of a rope, and uh, surveyors would uh, move around the seafloor, drop the lead lines, and measure how far they sink to the bottom. So you can imagine if we had to map 70% of the earth uh, this way, this would take quite a long time. So luckily, we've come up with more advanced technology throughout the years to um, allow us to collect higher resolution maps of the seafloor. Uh, this is and fast forward to the mid uh, 1900s, Marie Tharp, who, is a, who was a geologist and a cartographer, as uh, commonly known as the woman who mapped the seafloor, uh, she was able to take uh, sonar profiles of the seafloor and align them to ship tracks from the ships uh, collecting the sonar data and draft very uh, high, high detail maps, so drawn by hand based on these sonar profiles. Um, so we were able to get more and more uh, information and higher resolution of our maps, but still this is a very manual process. And if we think about uh, current day technology, so in uh, this is from a survey in 2013, so modern day, we now have uh, sensors and tools that can allow us to uh, complete these high resolution mapping efforts with much more uh, accuracy and with much less uh, manual manual uh, drawing involved, thankfully. Uh, so you can see that this is a map from a multi-beam sonar that was mounted on a ship. And uh, this is a survey near the Gulf of Mexico. And with these surveys, we can collect very high resolution structural information about the seafloor. Uh, but we still have really a long ways to go. So it's commonly referenced that we know more about the moon and Mars than we do about our own seafloor. And what that really means is that we have higher resolution maps of the moon and Mars than we do of uh, the seafloor here on Earth. So both Mars and the moon are 100%, almost 100% mapped up to about a 100 meter resolution. Uh, but Earth's ocean is only about 20% mapped uh, at a range of 100 to 800 meter resolution. And you can think if we had uh, a grid map at 100 meter resolution, there are still quite a few features that we might miss, right? If we're trying to do uh, detailed surveys of the seafloor, or if we're trying to identify objects that are smaller than this resolution, uh, we still are going to face challenges in what we can see and understand in ocean exploration. On top of this, resolution, structural resolution isn't the only thing that matters. Uh, so for a lot of applications, color also matters too. Uh, so I've collaborated a bit with marine biologists and they're interested in studying changes in coral reef systems over time. And for uh, scientists, coral 
color of coral reef systems can be an important indicator for health of the reef. Um, so it's important to be able to uh, observe and measure the color of these environments as well. Uh, so you can see on the right, some healthy coral, uh, which has polyps that live on the coral. They live in, they have a symbiotic relationship. When the coral becomes stressed, it expels the polyps, leaving just the bone structure of the coral itself, which is referred to bleached coral. So again, structure is one cue, but color is important too. And still the main uh, mode of sensing that we have for observing color, um, whether it's on land or underwater, uh, is using cameras. And cameras, of course, are not new, uh, but what is relatively new is our ability to bring cameras to uh, the depths of underwater environments. So now we have uh, the ability to attach cameras to underwater robots like this Iver uh, autonomous underwater robot here uh, surveying the Great Lakes. And we can send these cameras to the bottom of the seafloor. So robots equipped with imaging sensors can provide high resolution colored views uh, of the seafloor uh, all the way up to the full depths of our ocean. So what's been really exciting in recent decades is that uh, more and more commercially available marine robot platforms are um, becoming available for lower cost, uh, low cost, but still high efficient application, highly efficient applications. So these robots from the ROVs, which are tethered remotely operated vehicles to ASVs or autonomous surface vehicles and uh, the IVER autonomous underwater vehicle you saw in the video uh, before can carry out very safe, efficient and systematic surveys over large areas. So these surveys can provide us with terabytes of image data and using computer vision algorithms, we can create high resolution color 3D models of the seafloor with data collected from robots or automated um, imaging systems. So this is a 3D reconstruction uh, created from imagery collected in Hog Reef, Bermuda. And the goal of this uh, survey was to be able to identify uh, scientific instruments placed uh, throughout the reef structure and to be able to monitor this reef over time. Uh, so one thing to note here is that this 3D reconstruction was created offline. So after we completed the survey, collected the imagery and compiled it, uh, still took several days to create this, um, this high, high resolution colored survey of the environment. And we really wanna work towards being able to equip our uh, robots and our autonomous vehicles with the ability to uh, perceive a 3D environment on board the vehicle themselves and reason about uh, different objects in that scene to uh, better, uh, better survey the underwater environments around us. So I wanna to talk today about uh, challenges across the span of robot vision and opportunities that we have to really overcome some of these challenges and push uh, marine perception forward. So I kind of map it out in terms of the hierarchy of vision, which like human vision has low level, mid-level and high level, um, high level components. So low level vision really refers to uh, taking the raw sensor data and processing it perhaps to denoise it, or in the case of underwater imaging, uh, to perform image restoration, which I'll talk a bit more about um, what exactly that means. But this takes the raw sensor data and outputs it in a more uh, usable format. In the mid-level range, we have tasks such as dense depth estimation or 3D reconstruction, where we're taking now the process sensor data and putting it into a different representation or a different format for some higher level tasks, where higher level tasks can really start to think about uh, scene understanding. So that might include scene segmentation or object detection, but really a way to uh, process the scene, uh, the full scene itself and draw out semantic information um, or higher level information that scientists or other uh, surveyors can use to make informed decisions in these environments. So first I'll start with talking about um, challenges and some methods I've developed to overcome challenges for uh, low level vision tasks like underwater image restoration. So when most people picture underwater imagery, uh, this is what they see. They see clear water, brightly colored coral and fish. And unfortunately, these images are mostly thanks to Photoshop. And what we actually see when we 
uh, look at our raw underwater images collected on board vehicles looks something more like this. Um, so visibility can vary, of course, depending on the underwater environment, you may get clearer or hazier water. Uh, but typically uh, for imaging surveys, we consider surveying about two to four meters above the seafloor. So you can see as you get uh, four meters, three meters, closer and closer, you can make out more features of the environment. Um, but we have a pretty constrained uh, range that we can make out visible features in RGB imagery in underwater environments. So we can look to physics-based models of underwater image formation for why this occurs. Uh, so as a photon of light travels between uh, the camera and the scene, it interacts with particulate matter in the water column and this can cause it to be scattered or absorbed. Uh, so absorption uh, causes attenuation, uh, which is wavelength and range dependent, and scattering leads to kind of a haze effect across the scene. But we can look to mathematical models uh, for explaining some of these physics-based phenomena. So the uh, process of underwater image formation, the model for underwater image formation, contains two, uh, two components. One is the direct transmission, which refers or which relates to this attenuation effect, where if we were to look at uh, colors imaged in air and then those same colors imaged underwater, we would see this exponential decay of uh, colors for RGB cameras. Um, it occurs at different rates for different wavelengths with uh, ocean environments showing a higher rate of attenuation for the red channel specifically. So that's this might be a color board imaged in an ocean environment. Uh, and the second component is kind of this added component of backscattered light. And uh, you can see that this occurs kind of similar to a fog effect in air. If you were to think about viewing a foggy scene, you can see as you get further and further away from the camera, uh, you see this haze effect that really degrades the image um, from how it would appear if just imaged on land. So what's important to note is that these underwater effects are range dependent. Um, so they depend on the distance along the line of sight. And this range dependency has a couple of really important consequences for uh, underwater perception and uh, computer vision, uh, computer vision methods specifically. So one challenge that um, this raises is that uh, for uh, images in air, when we develop thought of developing feature detection and matching algorithms in traditional computer vision approaches, uh, we typically rely on uh, ideas such as uh, contrast to make sure that we are uh, detecting repeatable and reliable features and imagery. And unfortunately, due to these underwater effects, uh, the same image patch or the same patch on an object, so this was on a rock platform imaged in air, uh, if we were to image this same feature underwater, we see much reduced contrast in the image patch itself. So this really ra raises a challenge in transferring uh, methods that we've developed on land, especially for um, feature detection, to be able to transfer those methods underwater, we uh, typically need to do some sort of processing in order to leverage those methods. Uh, the other challenge that this raises is uh, challenging photometric consistency. So on land, especially uh, with uh, the popularity of direct SLAM methods uh, in recent years, we use this this constraint uh, that we assume that if we view a feature point from one angle and one viewpoint, and then we move to a different viewpoint, we'll have some measure of uh, brightness constancy or photometric consistency. And unfortunately, when we uh, look at these uh, cases underwater, we see that these assumptions can break down due to the range dependent effects. So since, since attenuation and backscattering are range dependent, uh, if we move to a different perspective that's at a different range, we can see inconsistent um, intensities and colors across, across these ranges. So this is really a challenge for uh, leveraging SLAM and computer vision methods that have been developed on land for terrestrial applications directly to underwater environments. So the first challenge I want to focus on is how we can address, uh, we can address these um, issues related to water column effects. And many people have come up with ways to think about these problems. Uh, so there are kind of two approaches. Uh, the first is a model-based approach. So looking at the physics-based model of 
underwater image for formation um, or physics-based models in general, we tend to have uh, explicit rules that are interpretable um, and provide more structured solutions to what we are trying to, um, trying to solve. But unfortunately, it's difficult to model every effect that might be occurring. Um, so if we have varying environmental conditions as we do underwater, it can be challenging to find a solution for uh, modeling every single water column effect that we might see or encounter. Uh, alternatively, you can take a data-driven approach such as machine learning or uh, deep learning approach. And data-driven approaches are capable of modeling very complex systems uh, using training data that contains some input and typically for a supervised learning uh, labeled output as well. And data-driven approaches can then model very complex processes, uh, but unfortunately they're referred to as black boxes. We don't always, we can't always interpret the output of what is learned. Um, and there are challenges to generalizability across different environments. And what's a major challenge for underwater perception is that we have a lack of ground truth for many tasks that we would want to um, perform. So if you think of the challenge of underwater image restoration, right, we don't necessarily have ground truth for underwater color of every scene that we might want to, um, that we might want to process. Uh, so kind of the opportunity we have here is we've had success in both of these areas. And is there a way to leverage success of both model-based and data-driven solutions? Uh, so uh, I've worked on uh, problems to basically integrate physics-based models into deep learning frameworks, um, as well as other constraints, such as geometric constraints about the sensor configuration or ideas from image processing uh, to allow us to structure deep learning frameworks in a way that um, can overcome this lack of ground truth. So I'll focus on one method where uh, we integrated physics-based models uh, into a deep learning framework for performing underwater image restoration. And this work was called WaterGAN. Uh, so it is an unsupervised generative network for color correction of monocular underwater imagery, images. And this network uh, works without having to have any ground truth, color, or depth of underwater scenes that you are working with. So the first step is to uh, generate synthetic underwater imagery. So taking uh, RGBD data collected in air and transferring this to have realistic underwater effects of the underwater environment that you are um, seeking to restore. Then we train an image restoration network that takes in the synthetic underwater image uh, and outputs the ground truth uh, in air RGB color and the depth map of the scene. And then lastly, during test time, we can take just the monocular underwater image as input and output a restored image of that underwater scene. So I'll walk through a little bit more about how this network uh, incorporates the physics-based model of underwater image restoration. But first, just an overview of uh, generative adversarial networks, which form the back, uh, backbone of the water GAN network. So GANs have two networks uh, that are kind of competing, the generator network and discriminator network. The generator network takes some input and outputs fake or synthetic data. And then the discriminator network sees the fake data and the real data and needs to determine whether, uh, whether that data is real or fake. So since we know what data comes from the generator network, we know um, which data is fake. So in this way, we get our labels for free. And the generator sees uh, the output of the discriminator network. So it can uh, constantly try to improve its fake data generation process in order to fool the discriminator network. So this is the overview of the water GAN network. Uh, so the water GAN network uh, features a generator that's really inspired by the process of underwater image formation to add structure uh, for training for this problem. And the generator network takes in a uh, RGB image and a depth map. So this was collected from open source RBGD data sets. Um, as well as the noise vector, and it outputs a synthetic underwater image that uh, matches the distribution of underwater effects seen in a real underwater data set. There are three stages in the generator network. So the first is modeled after attenuation. Uh, so based on the physics-based model of attenuation, uh, we are seeking to learn simply the attenuation parameters 
for this underwater environment. So uh, for RGB images, we have one parameter for each color channel. So we have the attenuation of red, green, and blue channels. Um, so the attenuation model is simplified by incorporating knowledge of the physics-based model of underwater image formation. And then we have a backscattering module that adds on uh, a, a mask similar to how backscattering uh, occurs in the physics-based model. Um, here we learn the mask and then it gets added to the attenuated image. And we also modeled uh, camera models for uh, modeling vignetting effects since that was important for this data set specifically. So at the end of this process, Watergate outputs a synthetic underwater image that is now aligned to a ground truth RGB, uh, RGB image and depth map. Next, we can train using this synthetic data, we can train an underwater image restoration network to go from that synthetic underwater image uh, to a depth map. And since we know that the image restoration is range dependent, uh, we concatenate the depth map to that RGB image to learn the final output for the restored image. And of course, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to get uh, ground truth underwater. So we create our own uh, synthetic platforms, artificial rock platforms in order to perform experiments to make sure that we can evaluate our methods quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, so this is a submerged uh, a artificial rock platform that we submerge in the water tank. Um, and we surveyed this uh, platform with a stereo camera system. And uh, we also submerge the, uh, we also can submerge a ground truth uh, color board to give us ground truth color only for evaluation purposes as well. Uh, so when we uh, train the water game network and the image restoration network, this is the output that we see. So for the real underwater image, uh, on the left, that is the input during test time, and the output is the restored uh, underwater image. So this shows um, kind of the quality that we're able to achieve without having any ground truth color or depth of underwater imagery for training or uh, as input for testing. And we're, of course, interested in the accuracy of the color reconstruction, so we can use the color board to determine uh, quantitative evaluation for accuracy of restored color. But we're also interested in restoring this uh, assumption of photometric consistency. So we're interested in seeing consistent restoration across different methods or across different viewpoints. So we compared to several different methods, um, specifically the histogram equalization and gray world methods are image processing approaches. Uh, so these methods don't have any knowledge of the physics-based model of underwater image formation. They're not incorporating any notion of range dependency in the restoration process. So you can see that these methods can give sometimes inconsistent uh, restoration results. Whereas our method is able to provide consistent color correction uh, across viewpoints from different scenes. One thing we were interested in, in seeing is if we could learn uh, monocular depth, uh, depth maps or monocular depth reconstruction from this method. And we found that we could uh, we could determine accurate relative depth for our underwater images, um, but they weren't accurate absolute depth estimates. Um, but this is one area that I think would be a really interesting opportunity since the process of underwater image formation is depth, uh, depth dependent, that you should have some extra information on top of what you have in terrestrial scenes to perform mon monocular uh, depth estimation from underwater imagery. So this is kind of the low level uh, imaging challenges and how we can use deep learning uh, specifically by integrating knowledge of model-based solutions for performing image restoration. So I wanna talk about how we can incorporate other constraints as well that we might have uh, known from our sensor configuration on our robot platform um, or from the image processing community as well. So for this work, we extended to stereo vision uh, to enable unsupervised learning for image uh, for image restoration and depth map estimation from underwater stereo images. And uh, again, our goal was to do this without having ground truth uh, depth or color of our underwater scene. So we incorporated physics-based models or notion, ideas from physics-based models again, um, as well as geometric constraints from the stereo vision configuration uh, and image processing approaches. 
And uh, this work was called Underwater Stereo Net, uh, which is unsupervised learning for a depth estimation and color correction of underwater stereo imagery. So again, this network had two uh, modules. So the first module was focused only on disparity estimation, uh, where it took input raw underwater stereo images and output uh, disparity maps. And here we really leverage geometric constraints uh, to learn uh, left-right consistency of the output depth maps. And then the color correction model took inputs, raw images, and uh, these estimated depth maps to output the corrected stereo images. And we performed some experiments uh, in coral reef surveys. So this was, again, near Hog Reef, Bermuda, with a stereo diver rig to collect data. And I'm only showing one uh, image of the stereo pair here, but we have the input raw image, I think the left image on the left. And the output of our method is now a dense depth map and the corrected color image from this raw input underwater image. Um, so again, this uh, output depth map and corrected color are enabled without having any ground truth color or um, ground truth depth of underwater scenes. Uh, and this is really this uh, unsupervised approach is really enabled by incorporating constraints that we have from uh, knowledge of the physics based models, as well as constraints from geometry and um, and knowledge from the image processing community as well. So we wanted to see how we could use uh, this pipeline in uh, an application for real time 3D reconstruction of underwater scenes. So as I mentioned, uh, we have the ability to create really high resolution colored 3D models of underwater scenes, but typically these are processed offline and can take um, several days and some human oversight to output an accurate 3D model. So we wanted to look at whether we could enable, uh, use this deep learning pipeline to enable real-time underwater 3D reconstruction. So this uh, framework takes in raw stereo images. It uh, inputs those raw underwater images to underwater stereo net, which outputs uh, the RGB image and the depth map. Um, I, we have uh, the output at about two frames per second on, uh, for purposes of this experiment, we were working with um, a laptop and streaming images over. Uh, so after we have images recorded on the laptop and we input the uh, depth and corrected color images into a pipeline for real-time 3D reconstruction. In this case, we used Elastic Fusion, which takes in RGBD data to output um, a dense 3D reconstruction. So our experimental setup was uh, stereo cameras mounted on board a blue ROV platform. And again, we submerged a rock, a uh, artificial rock platform uh, to have ground truth for studying this problem. So this is the input RGBD, which was output from our underwater stereo network and uh, input to the elastic fusion pipeline to perform real time 3D reconstruction um, of this underwater platform. So we have pretty promising results for this, which was exciting to see that we can kind of leverage deep learning pipelines to enable real-time uh, real 3D reconstruction and perhaps other uh, processing for um, real-time perception in underwater environments. So this brings us to uh, high-level vision uh, for scene segmentation. And here I just want to uh, highlight some ongoing work uh, that we have uh, that we have recently started in the field robotics group. Um, so scene segmentation refers to the ability to uh, process underwater imagery or process raw imagery, uh, perhaps perhaps represented as uh, dense depth estimates or 3D reconstructions, and output some higher level knowledge of the scene. So this in this case here, uh, we were looking at um, a submerged underwater city where we wanted to detect man-made structure from the underwater uh, underwater seabed environment. Um, so in the field robotics group, we have uh, recently started a project for automated detection of shipwreck sites from marine robotic platforms. So this brings up a lot of the challenges of working in underwater environments um, that we have ac limited access to ground truth data for um, or labeled data, I should say, 
for many tasks that we might want to pursue across marine robotics applications. So for this case, we're focused on uh, working with side scan sonar data collected from autonomous underwater vehicles. And we're going to be performing uh, surveys and tests in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And the National Marine Sanctuary Thunder Bay is unique in its uh, abundance of shipwrecks. Um, so there are hundreds of known or unknown, but yet to be found uh, shipwrecks that lie in Lake Huron. And we're going to really take advantage of this, uh, of this uh, environment in order to collect a really interesting data set of side scan sonar imagery for um, shipwreck sites. And we're focused on the challenge of enabling automated detection on board an AUV um, of interesting, of sites of interest so that we can survey these sites um, at a closer range. And there are many challenges uh, to this problem, uh, including lack of labeled data, um, but also just the challenge of processing a, a unique sensing modality for underwater vehicles. So we have some upcoming field work for this uh, project next year that we're really excited uh, to, get, to get started on. So I just want to kind of take the last few minutes to summarize the uh, challenges that uh, we have for underwater robot perception. And of course, one of the main challenges arises from the environmental effects uh, or these water column effects that are really unique to underwater environments. And they vary across different sites. So we need to be able to develop methods that not only um, can operate in a single site, but can generalize across different sites as well. So this is really a unique challenge for underwater vehicles. The second challenge is that we have a lack of ground truth data, uh, whether, that, whether that's because we have uh, different sensing modalities that we work with underwater, since a, such as side scan sonar, um, or because there's uh, just the lack of, uh, lack of resources for generating large labeled data sets of marine environments, kind of in contrast to what we've seen in uh, the autonomous driving community, where, we, where the uh, access to large labeled benchmark data sets has really spurred a lot of recent advances in uh, computer vision for autonomous driving. We would like to see you know, those same successes underwater, um, but one of the challenges we might have to overcome is uh, this lack of ground truth. And lastly, what I didn't quite touch on, but that's really important to keep uh, as a reminder in the context of working with marine robot, robotic vehicles is that we have limited communication to our vehicles uh, when they are conducting their underwater surveys. And this just really motivates, um, motivates the need for enabling these vehicles to have more autonomous capabilities so that they can perform large scale, efficient, repeatable surveys on their own um, and explore reason about what sites are interesting to go explore those sites further without human input. So this limited, uh, the limits to communication underwater um, are really a challenge. Um, but all of these challenges, I think, can be turned into opportunities for developing state-of-the-art, state-of-the-art methods for marine robots. And the first opportunity is really to think about how do you incorporate model-based approaches with data-driven solutions uh, to enable unsupervised or self-supervised methods for uh, marine robot perception. Uh, the second is, I think, uh, promise of modular systems for robust perception. Uh, so I focused in my work, uh, such as underwater stereo net, to make these systems as modular as possible, um, so that perhaps we could swap out uh, swap out systems such as the front end um, systems for underwater SLAM with deep learning modules instead to um, work towards more of a modular solution while still leveraging the frameworks that we've developed over the years in robotics um, that really do have great success as well. And lastly, as I hinted with the limited communication, we have an opportunity here to develop methods for real-time processing of onboard, uh, onboard marine robotic platforms. So leveraging these uh, new technologies to enable our, equip our vehicles with more real-time autonomous capabilities, I think is a really exciting opportunity. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge uh, my UM collaborators as much of this work was done during my PhD at U of M uh, and then my previous and, and current funding uh, as well. 
And just a, a plug that the UM Field Robotics Group is uh, looking for students this year. So always excited to hear from um, potential future students. Thanks, Catherine, for the wonderful talk. Uh, those are really exciting results there. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe I'll start with a, uh, a simple question on like, um, so is a, is a projective camera model uh, still valid for underwater applications? Um, so the pinhole camera model isn't exactly um, accurate, but it does work well in practice. Uh, one of the other challenges I didn't mention here is refraction um, and that can break down um, assumptions for the pinhole camera model. Um, so refraction occurs because we have to put our cameras in underwater housing. The light rays go through um, an air glass interface and then a glass water interface. Um, so there are some ways to overcome these challenges. One is we calibrate our cameras underwater. Um, so this can kind of mitigate some of the error from uh, refraction effects. Um, but definitely there's a lot of a lot of work in how to accurately model um, accurately model these effects for camera calibration and for um, and for generally mitigating errors that arise from from refraction and underwater effects. So you, so you need that calibration step within the underwater. Uh, with the underwater uh, images themselves. Yeah, we we actually uh, waterproof our calibration boards and <laughs> perform the calibration underwater. Um, there's also dome ports are widely used underwater as well. Um, so that can also help to uh, reduce effects of refraction too. Cool, thank you. Uh, and then maybe a follow-up question on, um, so the, uh, it is more on your water GAN work. So the magnitude of uh, backscatter and attenuation may vary depending on how turbid the water is. So does water GAN give similar results for different turbidities? Um, so we tested water GAN in kind of the tank environment and then in real environments um, from data collected in um, Jamaica that did have um, pretty high turbidity. Um, and we saw, what we saw was that the um, results were consistent across different sites. So um, one thing to note is that we did retrain, we retrain it per site. So we assume that we have similar water column effects in a small local area, and then we retrain the network per site. So that is you know, one way to help us overcome um, overcome challenges with having different haze effects across different environments. But we'd certainly like to work towards um, developing generalizable methods that could you know, be thrown into any underwater environment. Interesting. I'm curious, like how, how often do haze effects vary significantly between the environments that you're doing it? Say you're testing in the same area, you're not changing your geographical location. Um, yeah, they can still vary even for one environment day to day if you have, um, you know, depending on weather patterns um, or even, you know, if you had strong voting traffic, <laughs> you could say. Um, so it really, it really just depends on the environment that you're in um, and what, what else is in that environment. Cool, oh, thanks. Okay, then uh, we have another question on, uh, I think the link between your water GAN and your further stereo work. So are there any connection between the image restoration model and the stereo vision model? Uh, and how does the stereo model uh, learn to restore color, color under an un unsupervised setting? Yeah, so the main um, the main way we leveraged kind of the physics-based model there was just the uh, notion that the image restoration process is range dependent. So um, that network is more of a traditional um, convolutional network, but we take as input both the disparity map and the uh, RGB image because we know that the restored image should have um, some notion of what that, that depth map is. Um, so yeah, this work was a little bit um, more abstracted, I guess, from the physics-based model, but more looking at um, you know, what is important for modeling or, or learning to model these effects. And that's um, the, really the range, uh, the range and the depth dependency is really important for getting consistent color correction from underwater scenes. 
Interesting. So like the depth information is probably encoded in the color artifacts that you see naturally. With it. Yes, that's, yeah, that's what we hope. Um, for this work too, we also looked at incorporating image processing methods. So we have uh, one component of the loss function is uh, working towards the gray world assumption. Um, so that also helps to constrain the um, image restoration component. So it is, it's taking some inspiration from the gray world assumption from image processing, um, but also ensuring that it does this in a um, consistent way according or well, taking the range as input. Cool. Thanks. Uh, we also have a couple of interesting higher level questions. Uh, so one of them is like, uh, so is there any insight from the underwater applications that uh, you've worked on that can be transferred to other domains, such as dealing with obstructions and visual slam or or some other effects like that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of some more more of the direct parallels are really uh, fog and air or haze and air follows a similar model to underwater um, underwater effects. So that's maybe one of the more um, more direct parallels. Um, but certainly carrying forward the idea of, uh, you know, generating synthetic data for training deep learning networks, I think can definitely be transferred on land, um, depending on, of course, depending on what environments you're looking in. So I've had um, prior work looking at how we can learn to model uh, sensor effects. So modeling noise in individual cameras or modeling um, color tone or blur and chromatic aberration, how we can uh, learn to augment simulated data with these sensor effects to improve uh, object detection from autonomous drive for autonomous driving applications. So I think yeah, learning network or using networks to learn to generate realistic effects <laughs> can definitely be transferred to different domains as well. Interesting. And maybe one follow up on that is, do you see like physics based um, like scattering models and things play a similar role uh, for those applications as well, like fog and haze outside of underwater environments? Yeah, I think a lot of the recent works using deep learning for um, dehazing even on land really do look towards uh, inspiration from the physics based model of, of image formation on land in the presence of fog. Um, so that's exciting to see. I think that uh, this idea of incorporating uh, physics-based models is a really, uh, a really useful uh, idea and can really help to structure deep learning frameworks to improve the training and um, kind of point, you know, point towards what we actually want the network to learn. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another interesting question on like. So for the level of detail that you're looking to achieve in reconstruction, uh, is there any inspiration in animals? Uh, so any specialized sensor found in nature for that detail of reconstruction? That's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> um, but if anyone knows, I would love to <laughs> love to hear about uh, bio, kind of bio-inspired um, vision uh, ideas as well. Um, yeah, and, and there's one question more on your platform. So what kind of uh, computing platforms do marine vehicles usually carry and are the vehicles energy constrained? Um, so it depends on the vehicle um, because there's kind of a wide range of tasks we want to achieve. Um, so there are remotely operated vehicles that are uh, tethered and those vehicles are typically larger platforms. Um, so you could have um, greater computing resources on board, but for kind of the lightweight, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles and micro AAVs, you're definitely constrained um, by size, uh, which of course can have, you know, working towards a smaller size can greatly reduce the cost of these vehicles, um, but they can, it can also enable them to go to uh, a different, a wider range of environments in general. Um, so definitely limited in computing resources on board. Uh, for the methods I've presented here, uh, we mainly tested them offline or off, uh, not on board, the vehicles themselves. Um, so that's kind of the next step is to um, maybe put a Jetson on board our blue ROV and, and enable onboard processing for some of these methods. Yep, yeah, that's really exciting. I think, uh, yeah, Josh has been uh, building such vehicles too in his lab. So 
I don't know if you had some thoughts to add to this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I, I think one thing is the size. So the, so the size of the vehicle really does limit about how much you can, you can uh, carry. And uh, for one of the things we, we have been trying to integrate a Jetson Xavier into a blue ROV system um, so that we can try and add more processing on board the actual vehicle itself, but that that's required us to increase the size of the system. Right. And, and, and things like that. So, so I think that there's definitely trade-offs between those two. And then um, the other thing to think about is if, if you're able to, if you want to be able to do processing at the surface, then you need to have more costly tether systems as well, which is another thing that, that, that in eventually uh, causes problems over time. Um, so uh, you, one of the things you can, uh, you can go to optical fiber based tethers, for example, um, but those can be easily damaged and things like that. So, so it really, and, and they limit how far the vehicle can really travel. Um, so if you want to be able to uh, have it autonomously nap a large area, um, then having a tether-based system often is not necessarily what you want to be able to do. So there's definitely trade-offs between those two. Um, yeah, and tether management definitely becomes a problem, <laughs> a problem as well on its own. Um, yes, absolutely. So. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think um, it's kind of exciting seeing the development of these underwater ROVs, like with more accessible platforms and uh, open source codes. Um, okay, uh, Catherine, maybe I'll switch back to a bit more technical question on your work. Uh, so there's one question on so concerning depth generation. Uh, was the left-right consistency idea similar to what other self-supervised depth, depth generation networks that target other applications like self-driving cars uh, use? Yes. Um, yeah. So this was, um, yeah, it's very uh, similar. So it's uh, differentiable bilinear sampling for uh, developing a loss function for left right consistency. So you can use the estimated depth maps to warp, essentially warp each of the images to the corresponding views. And then that can be kind of a self supervised signal for, um, for learning accurate depth maps because if your depth maps are accurate, you should be able to warp the images, the left image to the right image and the right image to the left image um, and have accurate reconstruction results for the warped images. Um, so yes, that's something that's been used for terrestrial applications as well. Um, one thing that was really interesting to us was that we actually pre-trained this network on cityscapes data, which you would think would be very different from uh, our underwater, <laughs> underwater data in many different ways. The baseline is very different. Um, and of course, the underwater effects are different, uh, but we actually had pretty, uh, pretty good results just with pre-training on cityscapes data. So I think um, these types of self-supervised networks are really, really useful um, in terms of generalizability, even if across different, uh, different configurations. So that was exciting to see. Um, we did have some, you know, improvement, of course, once we, once we fine tune on our own underwater, underwater data, but it was exciting to see just how well it worked, even with training because I didn't expect that at all. Interesting. Yeah, I think maybe this is an example of insights transferring across applications as well. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so and another question uh, that we have is, uh, so is there any other information that you combine with RA sonar when you're trying to recognize shipwrecks? So like, how do you get ground truth for those shipwrecks? Or was that using any ground truth, the result that you were showing? Oh, so we don't have, um, this is kind of a new project we've started. So we haven't done, um, so we're developing methods now to do deep learning based shipwreck detection. Um, the methods, there have been a couple of methods that have come out um, that really look at um, the shadow effects from objects in sonar imagery. So that's kind of one cue that we have looking at sonar imagery for detecting in in interesting objects. Um, but there's of course a lot of a lot of distractors and a lot of um, challenges, especially with complex terrain um, for interpreting sonar imagery. So one kind of challenge we've seen too is that in having experts label sonar imagery, uh, it's challenging even to know where to define the boundaries of objects sometimes for expert viewers because of the shadowing effects. Um, so even, even the process of having a human hand label a large sonar data set um, would be pretty challenging. So this image was um, 
from our collaborators at Michigan Tech and the Great Lakes Research Center. And this was really a close range uh, high resolution survey of a shipwreck um, with a known location. So the uh, idea for us would be to be able to take higher altitude surveys. So we would have low resolution imagery um, coming in and we wanna be able to detect, detect shipwrecks from that low resolution sonar imagery. But a lot of really interesting challenges um, there to think about what cues we have from sonar imagery that might be different than what we have from RGB imagery. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really interesting problem too as well. So in the underwater domain, like like Katie mentioned, there's it's really difficult to get uh, labeled data and, and even large amounts of data is difficult to get um, in general. Um, so one, one, Katie, one, one thing I wanted to ask was just, do you have any ideas about, other than automatically generating that data, um, do you have any ideas about sim to, sim to real transfer of data or anything like yeah, that? Exactly. So where um, that's kind of one of our focuses for this project is leveraging simulated data. Um, there aren't a lot of open source uh, sonar simulation <laughs> platforms oh, either. So, uh, so we're, we're, we actually are awesome. releasing an open source um, oh, uh, perfect. <laughs> sonar simulator um, right now. So if, that, if that's something you're interested in, I can, I can get you access to that as well. Yeah, it's, that's it's definitely fun. something I'm interested in. Um, okay. Yeah, even, and one thing we're really interested in too is, and we've seen kind of this trend for terrestrial applications too for autonomous driving is being able to leverage low fidelity simulation. So, you know, it's going to be challenging to make a, make a perfect um, simulator for any environment or any task. So how can we, how can we ensure that we can still make use of lower, like low fidelity simulations um, without having, you know, a perfect replica <laughs> of our underwater scene. Um, but yeah, Josh, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I'd be happy to send it to you. It's called it's called Hollow Ocean, and, and we've been yeah, we've been right now. We have imaging sonar, and we're hoping within the next uh, month or so to have sight scan as well. So, yeah, I definitely hope that the um, that the sim to real uh, sim to real can transfer um, to the underwater environment and underwater perception specifically. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I feel like uh, the thing that you were showing, the results that you were showing with the water gun, like with the air images and underwater images, like there was, there was kind of a gap there also. So there was already like some gap that the network was sort of interpolating uh, between the images. Uh, I mean, I mean, this is a different use case, but like, it's interesting, like if um, there's a simulator and maybe that's the gap that it's gonna cover, like going from a simulator to actual images rather than air images to water images. And that's- yeah. Yeah, this was, and this was one reason we really looked towards structuring. So the generator is pretty highly structured, right? There are pretty, there are not that many parameters that it's learning compared to a traditional convolutional network um, because we really integrated the physics-based model here. And one of the reasons we did that was because uh, we saw that the, like looking at typical like cycle GAN networks, for example, going from air to underwater, what we saw was that the in-air imagery has such a different spatial distribution of features than underwater imagery, um, that the network was also kind of learning to transfer uh, the structure as well. Um, so yeah, this that was kind of one reason we looked to structuring the generator. Um, so it has kind of a limited, uh, it has limited ways it can change the image. So it's really only allowed to change or to add attenuation um, according to the physics-based model based on the learned attenuation parameters. Um, so that was kind of one nice benefit of incorporating the physics-based model was that we could constrain the network to only change uh, specific aspects, um, which here were the underwater effects, not the spatial, <laughs> spatial arrangement of the image. Yep, makes sense, yeah, cool. Uh, Josh, just to ask, like, is your uh, simulator physics based or uh, the? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so yeah. It's, yeah, so it's based on Unreal Engine. Um, so, so we have, uh, you can generate automatic, or you can you can generate actual three D structures within the space, and then we're using the projective model of a sonar in order to try and generate what that data looks like. So, one of the things we want to be able to do. Uh, relatively soon here is incorporate noise in a more accurate way. And cause that's, that's a more complicated thing for sonar, um, especially with reflections and reverberations and lots of other things that can, can add noise uh, to, to the, to the sonar. But right now, right now we're able to generate 
uh, based on the, the projection model of the sonar, we're able to automatically generate uh, imaging sonar, multi-beam imagery of, of 3D structures, and then I'll put that as, as an image. Cool, sounds, sounds cool. Um, okay, and maybe, uh, yeah, switching gears a bit, uh, Katie, we have a question still coming in. So I think this one, for this question, maybe your field work uh, comes in uh, handy. So much of the, the question is much of the interesting biology happens at the interaction between mediums, so coastlines, shallow waters, uh, kelp forests, et cetera. So any particular challenges that you see for enabling robotics in those areas? Um, I think there's kind of recent interest in uh, platforms that can go from underwater to shore environments. Um, I think they're called amphibious platforms. Uh, so that would be really interesting to see how, um, you know, we could design perception systems for those types of vehicles uh, that would be going in and out of the water, I think that would be one really interesting kind of interesting uh, thing to see come out of those applications. Um, some of the challenges, there are just, I guess, general challenges in working in near shore environments. Uh, and that really just, you know, might change the type of platform that you choose to use, uh, depending on uh, especially how, how much vegetation is there. Uh, this could be a challenge for autonomous vehicles um, going into some of these environments. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. I think I think the um, the, tr the ve these vehicles tend to be somewhat expensive, and it's somewhat dangerous to operate them uh, in in those environments. And especially with vegetation or shallow water, those are places where it's easy for the vehicles to get damaged, right? Or for for waves to to smash them into the into the shore, or or for them to their uh, them to get tangled in some way. Um, so that's that's another situation. That, that's a problem for general autonomous underwater vehicles, but especially when you have tethers, um, that, that becomes a big problem to be able to operate in those locations. So, so de uh, designing specific vehicles in order to operate in those spaces is a really interesting idea. Um, and then there's interesting perception problems within that space too. Yeah, the vehicles I've seen that go kind of from shallow water to land are kind of focused on, you know, being able to overcome challenges of waves crashing across the beach, um, so building more robust platforms for those types of environments. But you can also think about, you know, multi-robot teams where you might have a UAV or a drone platform that's helping to survey um, survey an environment like that, that might be more challenging for an AUV. And then, the, then there's interesting perception problems that come in there where, where you're trying to merge mapping information or, or perception information from these different platforms that that move in different ways and potentially perceive the environment in different ways. Um, so. I think, uh, yeah, that, that seems like a lot of exciting research and technical challenges or even system building challenges both for such yeah, platforms. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, okay, uh, I guess there's one more question on the slide that you are on uh, currently. So. Uh, what were your observations with this structure generator? Like, was the structure generator more stable than what a general GAN uh, would be? Um, yes, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, a nice kind of outcome of the structure generator was that it was much easier um, to train than typical GANs can be pretty unstable. Um, so that was definitely one nice benefit of structuring the generator this way. Maybe like, and that insight transfers across, uh, going back to the, one of the questions we had earlier uh, to different domains. Yeah, I think well. anywhere you can add, you can add structure, um, especially, you know, structure that's based on our knowledge of the problem we're trying to solve. Um, anywhere you can add structure or constraints from our own knowledge and experience can be a really useful, uh, a really useful way to think about designing deep learning frameworks. So, so I have a, I have a quick question too. So, so usually when you incorporate structure like that, it enables you to be able to generalize more easily, right? Because because you um, instead of learning for a specific situation, um, the the structure and the mathematical theory behind it tends to localize you to be able to generally to to not change much of the network, and so you end up with something that generalizes more easily. Do you have any thoughts about how you would? Um, how you could make something like this more generalizable um, so you don't have to train necessarily parameters every time. Yeah, I think one challenge um, 
here is just access to data from different environments. Um, so we never tested uh, just training the network on a wide range of input RGB images, but I think that could be um, that could definitely be possible. And especially for the underwater image restoration network, um, I think if you had a really large synthetic data set that you had generated from different underwater environments, uh, I would hope it could def it could learn to output more of a generalizable um, image restoration process. But that was something we didn't test specifically for this network because we were um, we were focused on learning the parameters for specific environments to study um, a local local area. And, and also probably due to, to the lack of data, right? The, it's it's difficult yeah, for, to get. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps for this project when we started, certainly. But uh, there's been a lot of really exciting uh, work now in deep learning for underwater image restoration. Um, and a lot of a lot of the recent works uh, can learn generalizable image restoration um, across different environments. Yeah. Maybe one quick follow up to like what Josh just think. Um, so I, I, when I was looking at your thing, I was wondering like it's fundamentally a low data regime, which makes it an interesting problem from both learning and model based side. Uh, but like, have you like there are some recent variants of GANs which would use like more unpaired um, image uh, image data to sort of learn some sort of like style transfer of one domain to another domain. So do you see that being relevant uh, for your application? Um, yeah, I think some of the ideas where it's separating the style and the structure of the images could be interesting. Um, I haven't tested it in a while, but um, when I did test the those types of networks a couple of years ago, um, I still, you know, there were still challenges just because the underwater domain and the st structure of the underwater images is so different from the in-air images. Um, so I'd be curious to see if um, kind of the more recent advances could overcome overcome that gap, especially with separating uh, separating the style and structure components. Because you would hopefully see that the style would align more with the underwater uh, underwater effects um, and transferring those. Right. Hopefully, it generalizes also then uh, better. Yeah. <laughs> So that's always the question. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, this has uh, been a great talk and a very great discussion section. Thanks, Josh, for pitching in as well, your uh, yeah. thoughts on this. And thank you so much, Katie, for your time and coming out here. Um, I think uh, we could probably uh, end at this. Uh, this is, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And Josh. <laughs> and yeah, fun. You too.